Diamonds used to be the most compact way to transport your wealth. Now with Bitcoin, if you hold it on your own wallet, you can literally hold a billion dollars in your mind. Welcome to Global Macro Update. This week, we discuss crypto criminals, the launch of Bitcoin ETFs, ways the blockchain is being put to use in the real world, and the safest way to invest in what sure seems like an asset class that is here to stay. My guest this week is crypto analyst Stephen McBride of Risk Hedge Research. Here's our conversation. So Stephen, in many ways, this conversation is kind of a, it's kind of a crypto reprise for you and I, right? We, we had a conversation, geez, almost three years ago in your hometown of Dublin, COVID lockdowns had just ended. People were out. People were happy. Uh, crypto was absolutely on fire. And you and I got together to talk on camera about what you were calling crypto 2.0. And there was a lot of excitement about it. And not long after that, the crypto market crashed. So tell me what happened to you, your portfolio uh, since that day. H how did you fare? Yeah, thanks for having me back uh, on Global Macro Update. Pleasure, pleasure to be here. Yeah, I think we met in late October or early November. And the absolute tippy top was, I think, uh, three or four weeks later. So look, it was... Um, 2022 was an incredibly, incredibly difficult year. It was the most difficult year of my professional investing career. <clears throat> um, and we had to make a lot of adjustments in the portfolio. Um, you know, at that time, as you said, crypto was really hot. Everyone wanted a piece of it. It was going to change the world. And then just everything blew up. And um, it really did test my conviction in this technology. I think it was essential to go through that and look in the mirror when prices were down, when funds were blowing up left, right and centre, um, when companies were, were uncovered as frauds. Um, and it was just an incredibly difficult time. I am thankful to say that through good portfolio management, um, you know, if you, if you look at true inception for, from, from when we met in late 2021 uh, to the end of last year, the portfolio was up around 37% versus down 30% for Bitcoin and the portfolio has been outperforming Bitcoin, which is our benchmark um, year to date. But it was, an, it was an incredibly difficult time and I think it, it made me double down on the reason I got into this technology, which is really that there's, been, there's world changing businesses uh, being built in this space. And you know, the good thing about bear markets and washouts is it wash, washes out all the tourists and the weak hands and I can confidently say, even with Bitcoin sitting at all-time highs today, Ed, crypto is contrarian again. Um, and I think um, we haven't been able to say that in quite a long time. Well, it's not just the uh, the weak hands that got washed out, right? A lot of the fraud got washed out too, right? We just had Sam Bankman-Fried get sentenced. Um, CZ, the, the founder of Binance, got into some trouble for violating uh, uh, the, the Bank Secrecy Act. Um, I mean, billions and billions of dollars with FTX wiped out. Looks like some of that, a big chunk of that might get recovered, but still, uh, it was, it was a massive fraud. Um, and, and that sort of follows crypto around. And yet at the same time, we just had Bitcoin ETFs get approved and, and had the largest single day of, of inflows to a new ETF class ever, $4 billion dollars in assets flowed into 11 ETFs uh, in a single day. So obviously massive, massive pent up demand, at least for Bitcoin. You just talked about what you went through in the, in the dark times. <laughs> um, what, 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 what's the state of the crypto industry today? Yeah, look, it was, it was incredibly dark times. Everyone, um, every investor um, and, and a lot of people uh, turned their backs on crypto and, you know, rightly so. Um, I think there was there was an incredible amount of fraud in the industry. I would point out that um, as long as you can sidestep some of that fraud, Sam Bankman Freed even fooled me. OK, but as long as you can sidestep some of that fraud, you can do incredibly well. And I, you know, I'm a student of history. You look at the early um, history of, of railroads, of canals, of the Internet. These new technologies, these new breakthrough inventions, they just tend to attract scammers. 
And unfortunately, that is the problem in crypto today. Um, 99% of crypto is absolute garbage. I wouldn't touch it. I think the other 1% will change the world. And you mentioned um, the ETFs. You know, just to give people some perspective, people might be asking, like, I've been hearing about Bitcoin for so long. Um, what, what, uh, what difference does an ETF wrapper make? You have to put yourself in the shoes of a Wall Street professional money manager. And a couple of months ago, if they wanted to buy Bitcoin, there was huge, huge career risk involved in that. OK, you're buying a new asset, but you also have to bet on an exchange that you don't think is going to get hacked. I don't think Coinbase has ever been hacked, um, but basically every other one has been hacked. That's a risk. If you want to take self-custody of it, well, that's also a risk because you forget your keys and your crypto is gone. And then there was the regulatory uncertainty. Um, there were surveys done and 75% and of investors said, I don't want to touch this thing until it has clear regulations about how you own it and what the asset is. Is it a security? Is it a commodity? So that was turning a lot of people off. Now you have this nice ETF wrapper that you can buy at least Bitcoin as easy as you can buy a stock. And as you said, the, the flows have just been um, tremendous. I mean, um, the gold ETF, uh, the, the Spider Gold ETF, that was the fastest ever ETF to accumulate $10 billion in assets. Um, they did it in... Uh, it did it in, I think, seven, it did it in three years, I'm sorry. Um, the Bitcoin ETF just surpassed that, $10 billion in assets, in seven weeks. Um, and the, the BlackRock's um, IBA ETF has, has seen 50 straight days of inflows, first time it's ever happened in history. So there's been tremendous, um, there's been tremendous money flowing into Bitcoin. And I think it's really important because until now, it was mostly just retail investors um, involved in this market and for the first time you potentially have that wall of money that 25 trillion dollars that financial advisors um, that financial advisors control coming into bitcoin so i think it is um, a truly zero to one moment for crypto i need a quick break to tell you that the strategic investment conference is right around the corner and you should be there virtually it's a virtual conference, online only, attended by thousands of investors around the world. Our lineup this year includes Felix Zuloff, David Rosenberg, Lacey Hunt, Louis Gav, Daniel DiMartino Booth, Lynn Alden, Neil Howe, Howard Marks, Leon Cooperman, and over 30 other economists, investors, and analysts. The conference is live. It begins on April 22nd. We'll have five full days of presentations spaced out between April 22nd and May 1st. Everything will be recorded so you can watch or listen later. We'll have transcripts and an interactive chat room for Q&A. I really hope you'll join me and John Malden for the 20th annual Strategic Investment Conference. Register today at SIC2024.com. It's interesting you bring up the gold ETF. I'm wondering what you think about these ETF wrappers, about ETFs holding so much Bitcoin. Bitcoin's not a stock, right? So, so, so when an ETF holds stock, it's 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 just another owner of a share of a business. No big deal, right? Bitcoin is not stock. Bitcoin is what? How would you? I mean, just just coming at this from the from the uh, the ill informed layman perspective, you've got something that sometimes is described as an alternative currency, sometimes described as a store of value, and yet it's being parked in an ETF. Is that good for Bitcoin? Bad? Neither? What What are your thoughts on that? I think it's ultimately good because it it brings money in that couldn't have had access to it before. I ultimately view what you're buying as a share in the network. Um, I don't think it's actually any different than it is. It is obviously different from a legal perspective of, you know, your rights to future earnings and things like that. But ultimately, you're buying a share in the network, in the Bitcoin network, or if you're buying Ethereum, a share in the Ethereum network. And that entitles you to, you know, so uh, in the case of Ethereum, you can earn a, a dividend uh, fr from the from the the from ethereum and the and the fees it it generates but um 
yeah, I mean, the, the ETF is good in the, in the sense that it brings in the money and you just think about, again, the gold ETF. It's kind of like, hey, we're holding this physical commodity that doesn't doesn't produce anything, but um, I guess it's worked out pretty well for gold, right? Can we talk about beyond Bitcoin? What are some of the use cases? Because I, and, and I, John Malden and I had this conversation last week. We both are, are big fans of the concept of the blockchain. We, we get it understand it. I'm trying to get better up to speed on the crypto side of it, but blockchain might makes a lot of sense. I could see how using blockchain could really be disruptive to so many sort of intermediary oriented um, industries. Like why do we have title insurance, right? Like what can, can we just figure out if the title's clean or not on real estate? That's just, just one example. So, so, you know, there's, there's thousands of examples of how a blockchain ledger could reduce costs and improve the system dramatically and reduce friction. So like, I get that, but, but I haven't heard about too many use cases yet. What are the, what are some of the real life use cases of crypto that you're that you're following or that you're investing in yeah so i think the first thing people have to recognize ed is that cryptocurrency or payments or or sending money across borders that's only one use case of this new technology it was the first use case it's the most famous but just like google is not the internet or amazon is not the internet bitcoin is not crypto so what's really going on here is that there's new businesses being built on this platform and they're building businesses in a way that weren't possible before. Um, they're, building, they're building businesses and doing things that once only a giant corporation, a centralized corporation could do, and now they're being run by thousands of people all over the world. So um, some of my favorite examples of blockchain in the real world, crypto uh, real world use cases is, first of all, HiveMapper. So we all love Google Maps. Um, anytime you look at a house on Zillow or book a place on Airbnb or track your parcel with UPS, you're using Google Maps. Okay, I think we'd all, uh, especially when you're traveling, you'd happily pay hundreds of dollars because Google Maps is amazing. But wouldn't it be even better if it updated in real time and instead of those Google Street View cars seeing your road or any given road once a year, once every two years, it could see it, tw- you know, 20 times a month or, or every every couple of days. So a, com- a little company called Hive Mapper said, we want to build a better, fresher Google Maps. But instead of going and paying half a million dollars to fit out those Google Street View cars that you may have seen, we're going to make this tiny little dash cam, cost $100 or, or $200. Anyone in the world can buy it. You can put it in your car right, right um, below your mirror and you can drive around. OK, and um, they launched 18 months ago. They uh, 100,000 contributors around the world have already mapped 10 million miles of unique or 10 million kilometers of unique roads or 165 million kilometers of, of roads total. And you might ask, OK, well, why is someone going to buy one of these dash cams? I think here we want to talk about the intersection of blockchain and crypto and how you cannot separate the two. So. Those Hive Mapper contributors that earn the da- that that buy the dash cam, they get rewarded with tokens for driving around. So when you map, um, say a road that has never been mapped before, or a, ma- a road that has not been mapped in a couple of weeks or months, you earn tokens for doing so. So this is this is the incentives at play. It's basically incentivizing people to go and build this really fresh, up to date map. And when you think about what people can do with that. It, it's ultimately down the line, you can see them building a better map um, than Google Maps. They have um, signed their first uh, customers. So I think that is a great example of a non-speculative use case. I'll just give you, I'll give you one more um, and, th- and then I'll stop talking. So we all know there's a huge AI chip shortage right now, right? Co- companies are scrambling to get their hands on NVIDIA GPUs for, for, for training uh, these AI models. So a, a company named Render, and there's another couple of, of companies doing similar things, they say, hey, what if we create Uber for GPUs? So on one side, you have all these GPUs sitting in people's homes or even in data centers around the world. 
and they're sitting idle 70, 80% of the time. So what you can do is you can go to Render Network and you can rent your GPU out to someone who needs it on the other side. So it's essentially a marketplace for AI compute. Um, and they're doing a couple of million dollars in revenue um, every year. Render sits in the middle. Most of the revenues go to those who are renting out their GPUs. Render sits in the middle and takes a little cut. So again, there's, there's lots of real world businesses building on blockchain technology um, and doing things that couldn't have been done before. Let's carry the Hive Mapper example through. Okay, so so I've been driving around uh, the booming metropolis that I live in in Connecticut of three thousand people, and uh, I, I've I now have uh, I've accumulated ten thousand Hive Mapper tokens. What 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 do I do with them? You can sell them if you want. You can sell them for U.S. dollars, so that gives people an incentive to keep driving. Who um, buys them? Who buys like what's them? The, what what makes it valuable? Yeah, so when companies want to pay for mapping data, so let's say in a hype, they have signed their first customers, but let's say UPS signs up. So UPS has to acquire Hive Mapper tokens um, to uh, pay for the mapping data. So that Got then it. creates demand for the, the, the product or the, it creates demand for the token. A lot of other projects, these are called, not, not to get too technical on your web, but they're called decentralized physical infrastructure networks. So there's there's a bunch of, of crypto projects building wireless networks, mapping networks, uh, storage networks. And they all kind of use this model that says, hey, if you want to use the network, you have to acquire the token. It's almost like if you had to pay for your iPhone um, using Apple stock or pay for Google search using uh, Google stock, kind of like that. That all makes sense to me, Stephen. I, I appreciate that. Is, are there any, you know, the other term that we hear tossed around a lot on the CNBCs and Bloombergs of the, of the world is DeFi. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me block, the blockchain technology would be a perfect tool to disrupt a lot of finance where, where uh, the, people feed off of being intermediaries and, and middlemen and, and, um, and opaqueness. What's happening in that world? Is there anything that is, is meaningfully, like you're talking about kind of new ideas. Uh, what, is there any, are there any existing infrastructure being disrupted or is that sort of being co-opted by the big players in finance and being kept in house? I think right now it's being co-opted, but I am very encouraged by a couple of years ago, the JP Morgans and Banks of America of the world, they were playing around with the technology, but they were building on private blockchains, their own blockchains. Um, I think we got big news and a directional change a couple of weeks ago when Larry Fink and BlackRock came out and they just tokenized their first fund on Ethereum. Uh, Franklin Templeton has done something similar. Um, I think a couple of private equity firms um, like Apollo and Hamilton Lane have, have also tokenized um, funds. But this is a big change because for the first time ever, a major financial institution is now saying, hey, we're putting our, you know, you can imagine e every single ETF is going to exist on a blockchain in, in three years. And those, those are not my words, those are Larry Fink's words, or at least that's what he is, has said publicly many times he wants to do. That's brilliant. So... I ultimately, uh, and just, just to give people some perspective, why, why would you do this? It does greatly reduce friction costs. It reduces intermediaries. You can collapse, you know, 10 or 12 steps into one or two steps. And it does something else. It gives you basically a global pool of liquidity. So it's actually very difficult for people in emerging economies to, to buy U.S. stocks. If that fund was on Ethereum, you can you can buy it with a, a couple of clicks of a button. So that's why you would want to do that, to, to, to tap into that, to that global liquidity. And ultimately, I think DeFi, people talk about it like this hot thing that people will, will use. I ultimately think it will be like a back end that every single bank and every single financial institution uses and like, a, like literally a global financial system. Um, so I think that's the future of DeFi. Um, and the tokenization of, of real-world assets, ETFs, um, mutual funds, commodities, I think that's what's, what's happening there. I'll note that Peter Thiel's um, venture capital firm has made um, significant investments 
in this area, as have others. Regulation is still an issue here. Um, but yeah, there's lots, lots of exciting new things. Do you think that it will actually make due diligence easier if, if done right? I mean, if you're buying a token's worth of a fund, a lot of funds, like say your, you know, your, your average BlackRock fund, right? If it's not an ETF, if it's, if it's meant for an accredited investor or a qualified person, uh, somebody who has a certain amount of investable assets that it has to be above a certain amount, um, if 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 the fund is tokenized, I would think anyone could buy it. So there's there, how do you how do you how do you guard against that? Do you need to? I mean, you could argue that look, anyone should be able to buy whatever they want. Uh, I, I I'm in favor of that thinking. But you also it's buyer beware, right? So like how do, does the fact that this is uh, uh, on a blockchain make make the asset more transparent to the average buyer? Well, it's abs- absolutely transparent. You know, people think that, that crypto is, is great for illegal activity or criminals. Um, I'll note that all a blockchain is, is a public ledger. And you can, Bitcoin started in 2009. You can go back and see every single transaction um, there. So in, in your case of um, not allowing people to buy certain assets or, or you know, geo-blocking things or whatever, there is absolutely ways to do that still in an anonymous way to protect your data. And there's something called uh, zero knowledge technology, which is um, absolutely mind bending uh, technology. It basically allows you to prove something without giving up any information about what you prove. It's like walking up to a bouncer in a nightclub and um, t- telling him you're, you're 21 and him being able to verify it without you handing over any information. It's, it's incredible. And I see uh, that's, that's great for privacy um, and it's, you know, all those type of things. So I ultimately see that being built into into a lot of this stuff. Um, so, yeah, it absolutely makes things more transparent. I think it will um, actually do away with a lot of financial crime because cops love crypto. It leaves, it leaves a, a, a bread, a, a trail of breadcrumbs um, no matter what you do. So, yeah, that, I think that's ultimately why um, regulators will come around uh, and financial institutions will be. Interesting. Okay. And I, you know, I may have sounded dismissive of the, of Bitcoin's use case earlier in this discussion, but I wanted to point out something that, um, uh, Lynn Alden pointed out to me, uh, in reading her book, Broken Money, which is an, an excellent book. Uh, she kind of walks you through the history of, of money from back, starting from when we used agricultural goods and shells to trade with each other right through to today. And then what could potentially be next. And, um, she makes the point that Bitcoin is, in fact, being used in some parts of the world for currency. Um, and it's easy as an American sitting here with uh, with the world's reserve currency in my wallet, uh, it's easy to lose sight of the fact that there are, uh, you know, I, th- I think she said 160 other currencies in the world, fiat currencies, that aren't necessarily so desirable and don't work as smoothly and so for people in other parts of the world, Bitcoin is in many ways um, a, a, a savior. It is, in fact, a store of wealth. And more importantly, it's a way to to transfer wealth from one currency to another uh, or to have it be portable. I mean, gold is, uh, gold, gold is a fantastic uh, store of wealth, uh, I believe, a um, store of value. But physical gold is not that hard to steal. Right. Pretty big flaw. Right. Two things on that edge, you can, you know, diamonds, there's all, you know, many, many stories of people, you know, during the Holocaust, Jewish people that, so, that you know, sewed diamonds into the, the hem of their dresses and stuff. Diamonds used to be um, the most compact way to transport your wealth. Now with Bitcoin, if you hold it on your own wallet, you can literally hold a billion dollars in your mind, which is incredible to think about. Also, I used to live in Argentina. Um, people would snap your hands off for dollar bills, right? And they were incredibly hard to come by, banks clamped down on things, just hard to get your money out of pesos by design. Uh, And now with a wallet and using a crypto exchange, you can either buy Bitcoin or you can buy what's called stable coins, USDC, USDT, and you can, they're basically uh, internet dollars. Um, So that is really a big, big deal for people in emerging economies that want to escape um, hyperinflation and, and protect their wealth. So yeah, it's certainly, if you're talk, I, I gave you some interesting use cases 
of, of crypto and they're still relatively small. If you want to talk about something that's actually taken off, just look at stable coins. I think there's $160 billion of, of essentially internet, internet dollars and um, outstanding. And again, I, I think a lot of that is, is driven by people and, you know, emerging economies wanting to, uh, wanting to escape via currencies. One of the reasons why I love having these conversations on film is it really forces me to sort of learn about things and and and, and research things that I might not be expert in, and, and and crypto is certainly one of them. And one of the places that I like to start with crypto is uh, Dan Tapiero because Dan uh, has a strong macro background, which I gravitate towards, and. Um, I've been able to. I've been lucky enough to know Dan for about a decade now. I knew him when he was really focused on on gold after the financial crash, uh, or the financial financial crisis crisis of 08, 09. Um And just to see over time, it's almost like a, a kid that you see every six months, right? Like you, you notice the changes <laughs> in their growth. You notice the changes in his thinking. And um, one of the strongest points that he made was he likened. He looks for asymmetric investment opportunities as a macro investor, of course. And he likened the adoption of Bitcoin to sort of where we were in the first ver version of the internet. Would you, would you agree with that? And, and can, can you add to that? What are your thoughts on it? I ultimately think as investors, we're here to make money. And a lot of people have been writing Bitcoin off for a very, very long time. And I think you just have to take a step back if you're if you're data driven, if you really care about making money and just ask, why has this asset kept going up? What is it about it that's so attractive? You know, it's it's been written off. It's been pronounced dead at least four times, as in in the sense that it's had, it's had four 80 percent crashes um, and it's bounced back to new all time highs every single time. People that call it tulips, to the best of my knowledge, tulips never bounce back and hit new all-time highs. So people have to people have to think about that. I mean, for me, I'm, you know, I really separate crypto ed into two camps. You have money crypto, you have Bitcoin, and then you have tech crypto, the hive mappers and the render networks and so on that, that we we're talking about. I've always been more focused on the tech crypto side of things, actual use cases that can change people's lives. But no doubt that the money crypto the this um global currency that's you know stateless money if you will um non-sovereign currency has captured people's um imaginations i think i'm still waiting for although there has been some activity more than ever on the bitcoin blockchain in the last year or so i'm still waiting for some use cases to be to be built on on, on top of blockchain or sorry bitcoin um, that really matter. But yeah, for crypto, if you actually look at the, the compare internet users to the number of crypto wallets, um, crypto is, go, is growing, I think, tr uh, three or four times faster, or maybe even more um, still than the internet was during the 1990s. So yes, we have these huge price fluctuations and people ask, what is all this for? But if you actually look at the number of active users, it's growing faster than the internet was um, in the 1990s and continues to grow. I mean, even in 2022, when the price was down 70%, um, the number of active wallets continued to grow. So that tells you as an investor, something is there. And I think um, for a lot of people, it might just be worth putting a couple of dollars in and then exploring. You know, Stan Druckenmiller has that like invest and then investigate um, framework. I think a lot of people would be served well to do that with crypto. At least the major ones. So you said you're still waiting for for use cases to be built on top of Bitcoin. That makes me think of Ethereum. Do you do you prefer Ethereum to Bitcoin? And and what do you see as the future of Ethereum? I do because I've always viewed Ethereum as um, as a real business compared to Bitcoin. So last, you know, just talking about re use cases and what is all this for? And um, last month alone, in March, Ethereum did over five hundred million dollars in revenue. Okay. There's, there's a lot of S&P 500 companies that didn't do that. Um, and there's, there's many, many use cases being built on top of Ethereum. I think one of the most promising is Coinbase has built basically a blockchain on top of Ethereum. And you think about Coinbase has 100 million registered users. They're making it really, really easy to build on, 
apps on top of Ethereum and, and users to come in. Um, I also like, you know, there, there's a, I don't mean to get too in the weeds here, Ed, but there's something called tokenomics. And it's basically how much, how much of a token uh, is in supply. How does the token accrue value from the business? Um, you know, you, you think about, hey, if I own BTC, how am I, you know, and, and, and Bitcoin generates a lot of activity, how am I benefiting other than supply and demand? Ethereum's tokenomics, in my view, are a lot better. Um, it's deflationary, meaning that more Ethereum is being born or taken out of existence every day than has been, been mined into existence. That's not the same for Bitcoin. And also, there's just a lot more activity happening on top of Ethereum. Um, I think the Bitcoin ETF was a, was a huge, huge moment. In my opinion, we get an Ethereum ETF sometime later this year. Um, you know, why? Uh, the same grounds that they approved the Bitcoin ETF on, that, hey, we list Bitcoin futures on the CMA, a regulated US exchange, and there's basically 98% correlation uh, between the, the price of the futures and the spot price. It's the same for Ethereum. So on those grounds, we'll see an Ethereum ETF. The other one is that BlackRock just doesn't miss. And now it has a big incentive to get an Ethereum ETF approved. So their um, approval rating for ETFs is 576 to one. Um, and of their 400, I think they have list 417 ETFs said to live today. One ETF, the Bitcoin ETF, has taken in 42% of their inflows year to date. So you better believe that Larry Fink has a big, big incentive to get more crypto ETFs approved. So look, Ethereum is, is the largest. I'm, I'm talking my book here because Ethereum is the largest position in our portfolio and has been um, for some time. So yeah, con continue to like it. Okay. So you're, you're in it to make money. You run, you manage a portfolio in your research service, which is called Venture. Can you, can you give me an idea of just how you generally approach running a portfolio, a crypto portfolio without, without giving us the, you know, I'm not asking for your entire book, but how do you, how do you manage the volatility? How do you sleep at night investing in a crypto? It's an incredibly volatile asset. Um, I would, I would say to people that the more volatile the asset, the quicker you have to be to take profits. Um, that's certainly what we've done this year. Um, look, I think you want to know what game you're playing when you invest in crypto. And um, you have to keep position sizes small or as a percent of your overall portfolio, okay? I think someone that has 100% of their portfolio or 50% um, is mad. You, you, will, you, will all, you will think, you will understand you own too much when it goes down 80%. Uh, and you panic. So really, we focus on, going back to what I said earlier, Ed, those businesses that are building stuff that couldn't have been possible before, okay? So using this technology to do new and novel things. Um, we do a lot of very, very deep research on the positions that we hold uh, to gain conviction in them because at some point, you will experience a, 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 a deep sell-off. And uh, yeah, keep keep the portfolio fairly concentrated and kind of know what you own at all times. Just to point out, I mean, I was I was surprised by this uh, doing research for this for this interview. So you and you mentioned it a little bit through the end of twenty twenty three. Since when you started your research service venture through the end of twenty twenty three, you're actually up thirty. Four or thirty-seven percent, some, some, something in that ballpark. When most crypto was, during that same time frame was actually pretty negative. Yeah, and look, that just goes back to having deep conviction in what you own. Um, look, as I said, twenty twenty-two was a was an awful year, and the start of twenty twenty-three was was no better. But again, you could see that a lot of this stuff had just been left for dead, and everyone that that was going to sell had sold. So. We doubled down on some positions. Um, we were nimble with how we managed the portfolio and cut losers. And thankfully, um, I think we're at the other side now. You know, crypto is, is one, one thing that I did estimate un, underestimate a little bit is that crypto is just incredibly cyclical. It moves in these four-year cycles around the Bitcoin halving. And I think that's something people need to be aware of. Um, but yeah, I, I'm glad that we're... Uh, we're, the the worst of the bear market is over. Actually, Ethereum bottomed um, almost two years ago now.
So um, I think this is this is the time if you're if you're thinking about investing, I would just invest a little bit and then investigate for yourself. Stephen, where can people learn more about you and your research? So you can you can find me on riskhedge.com or you can reach out uh, on Twitter to me at disruption at disruption hedge. All right, Stephen McBride from Risk Hedge. Always good to see you, Stephen, my friend. Take care Thank and be you. well. Thank you for having me. Ed. Before you leave, I want to invite you to join my global macro update newsletter. This is a free service that comes out every Tuesday and Friday. I'll send you an email with my latest thoughts on geopolitics, economics, the markets, along with a link to the latest interview and a transcript. If you'd like to join us, hit the link in the description below or go to globalmacroupdate.com and join over 100,000 other Global Macro Update readers. I hope you join us. I'm Ed D'Agostino. Thanks for watching.